Hello! Before we get into this episode, you'll realize that we are on a new set because this is the first time we're shooting on this set. It's beautiful as you can see, so from here on out, we'll be here. It's the same podcast, I assure you, just a different set, same two idiots, and we have a guest this time. I'm the guest. <laughs> Welcome to For Your Amusement, a theme park podcast that aims to exhaustively evaluate the world's most popular theme park attractions to determine if they are world class. I'm Ryan Bergara. I'm Byron Marin. And I am Dallin Smith. That's right. You might know him as Offhand Disney on YouTube. <laughs> offhand Disney, just a bunch of offhand. That's why it's called that, right? Exactly. Literally just spouting out facts that nobody cares about. And offhand. beautiful tangents, which you'll see today. Oh, you're going to see uh, a lot of them. On this Halloween episode. And as for this episode's featured attraction, don't adjust your volume. We'll do that for you as we discuss the Haunted Mansion in Disneyland and to a lesser extent, Haunted Mansion in uh, the Magic Kingdom at Disney World. You know, there's a, there's a Tokyo version too, right? There is... I haven't been to Tokyo. And a different iteration in Paris. Which Paris. And then they went even further into Hong Kong. Okay, there's no need um, to get litigious right now. But <laughs> We're just starting the podcast. Too many mansions. To, too and, too and, many and, mansions. And I, and I was doing a fun little gag there about don't adjust your volume because it's you know a reference to the ride. Yep. Uh, but you, you're going to have to adjust your volume <laughs> if it's too low. I can't help you with that. I don't want to hear anything like, this dude's a fucking liar. <laughs> he told us to adjust our volume. I already adjusted it. He didn't fix it. No, exactly. And I don't want to lose a star. I need those stars because this is an early podcast. It's in its infancy and we need all the help we can get, which is why we brought in Dallin over here. I'm here to lead the conversation on Haunted Mansion. I'm doing most of the like work here today. That's obviously. right. You know, we've been working him around the clock like a dog. Mm -hmm. Why don't we kick it off with a little history, Byron? It's going to be a little odd that you're going to be telling history to uh, Dallin and also me because, I, you know, I'm an expert. Let's, in uh, yeah, <laughs> let's if, get that scorecard out. We'll see how I do. Right. Um, but we're going to go all the way back to 1951. No Haunted Mansion at the time. Heck, there's no Disneyland. As a matter of fact, there's just an inkling of an idea. This idea for a theme park, a Mickey park that's going to take place potentially right across the Burbank studio lot. Maybe just a little over 10 acres of land. Walt's dreams with the Imagineers, it gets bigger and bigger. So 10 acres turns into this 100 acre dream. We get Disneyland in Anaheim, California. Now, way back with the Mickey Park, early renderings, early concept art, there was this idea tucked in the back of a Main Street looking plot of land, there would be a haunted house themed attraction. This doesn't open with Disneyland in 1955 due to budgets and, you know, time constraints with building the park. Haunted Mansion idea gets totally shelved. Mm -hmm. But in 1957, once it's up and going, Walt Disney revisits the idea in correlation with his desire to expand the park west of Frontierland with a New Orleans themed area. This is when he enlists Imagineer Ken Anderson, who had worked on Snow White's Scary Adventures, a pretzel dark ride in Fantasyland. Which, by the way, well. if, if you have time to go check out some of the original footage of the uh, the Ooh. Snow White's Enchanted Adventures, I highly suggest you do because it is the stuff that nightmares are made of. The I don't know. changed Snow White's Scary Adventures? It's insane. They, went, oh, they went crazy with Especially that, that Magic Kingdom one. I don't know how it was allowed. I don't know how they let children get on on that ride it is one of the scariest things i've ever seen i wonder park. if it's like they needed you know because pretzel dark rides were a thing haunted houses were a thing they didn't have the haunted mansion at that point so they needed something a little spookier ken anderson who had worked on a scary attraction in the form of snow white as well as mr toad's wild ride seemed like the right guy for the job and he starts looking for inspiration and he finds this photo of a Shipley Lidecker house that was located in baltimore maryland which is kind of funny because they're looking for a new orleans based looking house, but the architectural design of this house really called to him and he put some concept art to it. Sam McKim ultimately creates the famous painting that many people still know of today. And although Walt liked the architectural look of this house, he didn't like how dilapidated it looked. As he famously put, we'll take care of the outside and we'll let the ghosts take care of the inside. While Ken Anderson is working on fleshing out potential storylines for the attraction, Walt enlists Yale Gracie and Raleigh Crump to begin researching and developing special effects and illusions to take place within this Haunted Mansion. Did this you, did Haunted you, Mansion attraction. I thought for a second you abbreviated Haunted Mansion to be Haunted Mansch. <laughs> My Which wife will do Manch? that. We'll be walking through Frontierland at Walt Disney World and she'll say, you want to hit up the Manch? I fucking love that, honestly. I it's, think that's great. I'm going to start saying little that. slang, little Haunted Mansion slang. I can't say it was intentional. That is a slip of the tongue. Um, Make it a thing. You know, some <laughs> of the best things, as with some of the illusions that actually happened in this attraction, happened by mistake. Happy accident. Back to the Haunted Mansion. <laughs> <laughs> 
At the end of 1959, Yale and Raleigh staged a mock-up of the attraction, which was presented as a guided walkthrough tour. Which was the Museum of the Weird, right? Was not Museum of the Weird. Raleigh Crump did Shit. that separately. Oh, where he did create some interesting looking artifacts and paintings. And it was in this big presentation that they actually gave to Walt Disney. <laughs> they were so worried about it at the time that they tucked it behind where Walt was like standing. Right. Is that correct? Yep. To look at it. And he it did eventually capture his attention. This is the most hilarious vibe right now because it feels very much like a student giving a presentation to a teacher. Byron's <laughs> every now and then- I'm sitting over here uh, like mentally grading you. <laughs> I know. Like, Byron's, you know the story about Walt? Byron's just stealing glances every now and then. Oh, over, yeah. Over at Dallin, just am I doing okay, Dad? Uh, <laughs> and I'm just kind of sitting here hoping, like I hope, I hope this is good. But everything seems accurate so far, right? So far, yes. Um, so far, you're. I just figured you're I was doing okay. I would, I would, I would so do far. okay, and then you get to clean up the mess later. Yeah, <laughs> I can was, just come in at the end of the podcast the, and give some notes. That was yeah. my, that was my, check. yeah, that was my game plan. He'll be our resident Snopes.com. <laughs> Museum of the Weird. That's something Walt Disney did suggest based on some of the artwork that Raleigh had there that day when they presented to Walt. We will fast forward to 1963. The mansion facade is completed at this time, and once again, that was inspired by the uh, ship. Lidecker house. So that is finished in 1963. However, we are many years away from actually getting an attraction. So it's merely a facade gets a lot of guests curious. While they do have this facade complete, they're kind of in a story limbo. And that combined with the impeding 19 64 New York's World Fair, Walt and his team of Imagineers have to really shift their focus over to work on those four attractions being Carousel of Progress, Small World, Ford's Magic Skyway, um, and uh oh, what's oh, uh, who's gonna who's gonna answer this one for who, the Daily who's Double? Got, who's got number four? The Daily Double. <laughs> which one? Which one did I not say yet? Uh, Small World. Forge Magic Skyway. Dead air right here. Progress. We have some dead air on the pod. This is a sad day for us here. You know, it only took a couple episodes. Your but... score is dropping by the second. <laughs> That's 75. <laughs> you hear that, Byron? That in the distance is the Who's sound it? of it's people on turning Street, their USA. volume knobs slowly down. It's on Main Street USA. It's right there. <laughs> Walt dressed up as him as a kid. Oh, great moments with Mr. Lincoln. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at, I'm at, I'm at We're going to continue forward. I, I'm I, I, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm at here. a C score. I'm just trying to pass at this I point. Hey, look, man, so another far. torpedo um, to the midsection. This mm. going down. <laughs> this is all going down. No, this is great. Uh, this is, this is, you, need, you need to see that we bleed. Anyways, Walt and the Imagineers, they shift their focus over to the attractions that debut at the New York's World's Fair. Ford's Magic Skyway doesn't make it back to Disneyland Park like the other three attractions but the ride system is pivotal it eventually becomes the people mover ride system which one day between a meeting uh, i believe it was with bob gurr and john hench he's spinning this was it a caramel apple yeah around and this kind of sparks this idea of what if we're able to pivot the ride vehicles which leads to a 1967 attraction in Tomorrowland called Adventure Through Inner Space. And they eventually take that ride system over to Haunted Mansion. The Omnimover. I want to backpedal for a second. You said that Ford's, Ma Ford's Magic Skyway didn't make it back to Disneyland. But not, it did. Not all it, of it, it. No. As the primeval world diorama on the <laughs> Disneyland <laughs> Railroad. Because oh, it does go back in time to the dinosaurs. That is oh a set. Oh my gosh. That is the animatronics and that some of the set is reused from Ford's Magic Skyway. Unfortunately, in 1966, Walt Disney tragically passes away just months before his final attraction, Pirates of the Caribbean. Success of Pirates inspires Wed to appoint Mark Davis, who is very much great with characters, a big time animator as well with a lot of the Disney princesses. And then Claude Coates, who is a big time set designer, was just excellent at creating atmosphere. And mood. So a scary guy suspense for Claude Coates. This is what he wanted Haunted Mansion to be. He wanted it to be a very scary, dark, ominous attraction, which leads him and Mark Davis to butt heads for potentially years. Mark Davis wants a funny attraction. Claude Coates wants a scary attraction. And what ultimately happens is you get a little bit of both. And this is the compromise. The first half of the ride becomes very dark, tension based very suspenseful, scary, and then it opens up into the Mark Davis side where you see all the grim grinning ghosts and you get the great music. I'm curious in where the split happens because I've seen online that the split happens in the ballroom. Everything before the ballroom is Claude Coates because it's spooky and scary. You got like, oh, you're, you're, you know, your spooky stuff. And then from then on, it's apparently Mark Davis, but then we go into the attic. 
is the attic also coats or was that Mark Davis being like, I could do a little spooky too. I feel like the attic is definitely half and half. Leota's room absolutely is the transition between like the eerie atmosphere and the kooky ballroom. Yeah. But then you get through the ballroom, you know, lots of visual gags and then you get into the attic nowadays more so with the 2006 update where they added in, you know, the whole new storyline with Constance. Yeah. But back in the day when it first opened, it was absolutely more atmospheric with the silent bride and the cobwebs that would brush past your face. I missed that. Also in that seance scene, a little Raleigh Crump in there. Wasn't he the guy that was behind the, uh, he it was the inspiration for that room and also the musical instruments, right? I believe so. Yeah. And the table, wrap on a table. In regards to story at this point, because obviously the indecisiveness when it comes to, you know, putting a foot down mm -hmm. on a story halted a lot of the, the development on this ride. They ultimately kind of lean on just letting it be an experience and taking in the atmosphere kind of the same way that they do with Pirates of the Caribbean. But this leaves them with the need to kind of string the whole thing together. What they did so well with Pirates as well, you know, using good voiceover narration, great music, and the guy for the job is Xavier Atencio. He writes the narration pieces, and right. then he also writes the lyrics for Grim Grinning Ghost, which he collaborates with iconic composer for Disney Buddy Baker. I didn't know Ex Atencio also wrote the narration. I just thought he wrote Grim Grinning Ghosts. Yeah, he wrote a lot of the dialogue for the ride, too. That's pretty baller. Yeah. Also, and he was, shout and out to Paul Freeze, one of the, the the butteriest voices you will ever hear on a ride or just in VO. I think he did stuff in movies. He's he was, got a voice that just slides across a pan like a stick of butter. He was the original Scrooge McDuck. No shit. Mm -hmm. A little throwback to what you were talking about, Adventure Through Inner Space, the first Omni yeah. Mover. He was also the narrator for that ride, too. That's Paul Freeze right. was. You are about to begin your adventure through inner space. This chamber has no windows and no doors. <laughs> Which, Which offers you this chilling this challenge, challenge to find. And if you were wondering, listener, that's actually me. That's not Paul Freeze. But I know that wasn't voiceover? No, I, I know we faded from Paul Freeze to me right there, and I know it's hard to tell who's who, but that was wow. actually me. That was a really good impression. I know, thank you. I've been working on it. August 12th, 1969, Haunted Mansion finally opens. This is six years after the completion of the mansion facade, and this came at a total price tag of about $7 million. Now, while they were actually building Haunted Mansion at Disneyland in California, coming down the pipe was the Magic Kingdom at Disney World, which was opening in 1971. So they were actually creating duplicates while they were building Haunted Mansion at Disneyland just so they could have it ready. Yep, opening day attraction. October 1st, 1971, with more of like a Dutch inspired, like Gothic. Yeah, uh, it's- Cause it has to blend in with Liberty Square as opposed to New Orleans Square. Cause you kind of come in from Frontierland and Fantasyland. So it sort of has that Gothic sort of almost cathedral look to it. And then on April 15th of 1983, Tokyo Disneyland opens. And with that park opening also comes their Haunted Mansion. Mansion it number three. Mansion, Mansion number, number three. three. Very much in the same realm of what uh, the Magic Kingdom's version oh, I is. I think it's almost an exact copy. Almost. I'm not quite sure everything is exactly the same, but the scenes are almost beat for beat Magic Kingdom. As was so much of that park. And oddly enough, it opens in their fantasy land because they don't have a New Orleans square. <laughs> That's and true. They have a hard time still justifying it. <laughs> but uh, anyways, April 12th, 1992, Disneyland Paris gets their own version of Haunted Mansion, but it opens under the name Phantom Manor, and they really like their spooky shit out there. Oh so they boy. like they that ride with Phantom, Phantom Manor opens 1992, <laughs> April 12th. And then finally, May 17th of 2013, Hong Kong Disneyland doesn't get a Haunted Mansion, but they get a spiritual successor, which is Mystic Manor. And they had to do this in order to adapt with the culture's different idea of what death is. Right. I will say though, a lot of people don't even consider this in the Mansion family. I would, but I would not blame you if you didn't. It can absolutely stand on its own. I, I've mm -hmm. seen people relate it more towards like a Jungle Cruise attraction almost mm -hmm. rather than a that. mansion. Well, I could so see that. It's a, a completely different, it's a completely different ride system. Yeah, there's it's, a, monkey, it's a trackless yeah. system. Yeah. You, you probably appreciate all the, the uh, Society of Explorers oh, and Adventure Don't even get me titans. started on that. But that just about wraps up our history. Oh, and then that means it's time for some fun facts. But before we get into that, let's have a word from our sponsors. Uh, fun facts. I'm gonna go through. I'm gonna go through these bad boys pretty quick because you know we we covered a lot in the history. There was a brief time where, and I did not know this, and I don't even know if this is true. There was a brief time where legendary Imagineer Claude Coates conceived of this as a water ride in which guests would float through the ruins of a partially submerged old plantation house. 
Is that true? I've heard walkthrough. I've heard Omnimover. I've even I've heard like Pretzel Dark Ride, like Fantasy Island. I've never heard a water attraction. I've never heard that either. So when I read that, I was like, that can't be true. But apparently some people Insane. believe that. Uh, it sounds cool. I'd like to see it. It like, sounds like something like a couple Imagineers cooked up one night, just drunk at a bar. And it's just in the deep <laughs> catacombs of Disney lore. I'm, but, ass- I'm assuming the thought, the line of thinking would be, we already have a boat attraction in Pirates of the Caribbean. We could li- we could just take that ride vehicle, take the ride system, move it over a little bit. You got yourself another attraction. And also, like if it's playing into that Captain Gore Sea Captain theme, it makes sense. I just like the idea of going through like a submerged house because I-, I like watching footage of like cameras going through like shipwrecks because I'm that would be interesting. A-, a fucking weirdo. But I do <laughs> like watching that, you know, just like Jim Cameron. He does that all the time because he has that kind of time and money. sunken haunted house in new orleans attraction that sounds incredible uh but it alas it never happened or maybe it never happened even in the conception phase i have no idea that's why these are fun facts because <laughs> there may not be true facts <laughs> anyways <laughs> apparently the haunted mansion is the only disney ride that is located in four parks in four different lands it's in new orleans square at disneyland liberty square at walt disney world frontierland at disneyland paris and fantasyland at tokyo and then we already discussed this there's also mystic manor and Hong Kong. Mystic Point. Too much money. It's, it's, it's got its own land. Yeah. Uh, we already talked about how the uh, the house took imp- inspiration from the, the Shipley Ledecker house in Baltimore. Or is it Lidecker? I'm not even sure. They also took inspiration from the Winchester Mystery House. They actually went and visited the Winchester Mystery House. Imagineers went over there and, uh, you know, looked at the interior because that's also kind of a whimsical, fun little house. Actually, this is actually a fun little trivia. The Hitchhiking Ghosts, apparently, they have names. Do you know them? The little tiny short one is Gus. Yeah. Ball and chain, tall one, skeletal looking almost, is Ezra. Not shame a day. And then the, uh, <laughs> no, different one. And then um, <laughs> the the portlier man with the, with, the, with the carpet bag is Phineas. Professor Phineas Plum. You know what's crazy is in my notes, I wrote down descriptors for all three of these guys, and he named all of the descriptors. <laughs> I mean, we can expand on that. Ezra, the, the taller skeletal one, is actually a similar face mold to the original Hatbox Ghost. We, we all know it. There was a Hatbox Ghost. Maybe there wasn't on opening day. Who knows? There's footage of it, apparently. Some guy found it in, like, his grandma's attic. He did. Yeah. He, there's, like, very, like, you know, it's kind of like the Zapruder film for Disney films. Uh, for, for Disney is. Park fans. There's a guy with his, like, home video on opening day, apparently, or maybe two weeks after, and there's footage of the Hatbox Ghost animatronic, and then it just suddenly disappears for what, like... I think it came back 2016, so almost 50 years? Yeah, it's almost 50 years years i don't know the mystery maybe they they concocted it for press i like to think that he was real like you can see pictures of yale gracie i'm pretty sure they're press photos because there's no way he's actually testing it out like this but he's testing out the um pepper's ghost effect and he's holding this hatbox ghost's head wasn't he like dissatisfied with it on opening like because the lighting nowadays they fix that but back then yeah you wouldn't be able to you'd be able to see both heads at the same time essentially they just take the light off of it and it wouldn't work but nowadays it's a projection so obviously they can just black it out and then they, it like sort of collapses in on itself so there is no head on his shoulders when his head is in the hat box I, I wouldn't put it past disney to make something up though because i there's a lot of people online that believe there's this footage of a ghost walking around haunted mansion outside and there's also one on space mountain That's disney a classic disney did they actually made, make was, those those were the days when they would put out just crazy what's the word i'm looking for it's like a, not like an arg but just like a random video on a random youtube channel you would never expect of just ghosts at Disneyland. Like everyone bought it. Everyone I bought, bought it. it. I, I thought, thought it was back a, in the I day thought too. it was a real ghost, but then the guy who made it came out eventually and was like, hey, that's not a ghost. I made this. Which is cool. Yeah. Cool to see that they're thinking out of the box. Maybe the hat box. <laughs> oh, okay. kill me. Okay, now this is a classic look. I know if you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know this, but in the off chance you don't, when you're in the stretching room, you're actually in an elevator. It's something that they concocted to get people under the railroad track. It's fun. Uh, the face of the caretaker is actually the same exact face of the guy who's at the bottom of the rhino totem pole on the Jungle Cruise. Used to be, right? Is it still? Oh the same no, because yeah, they, because they, they did redid upgrade, the upgrade animatronics. The, so, yeah, Jungle Cruise. So now uh, it used to be. They used to be the exact same face, which I actually never noticed. The Raven that appears in several rooms in the ride was originally intended to be the guide for the ride, but that was later nixed for the idea of having the ghost host do that. However, the Raven is still in the ride. You see it in the coffin scene. You see it over, I believe, in the seance room. And then, Yeah, he's on the chair in the seance room. Yes, and then there's- Where else is he? Oh, God, where else now is he? Right? Now it is your turn to be tested. Is it, he's on uh, the descent from the attic into the graveyard scene? Yes. Is there another one? There's another one. Oh, son of a bitch. Sometimes he's gone. Sometimes he's there. Think about it. I'm thinking. Five, 
four. Is it by the everlasting hallway? No. Damn it. Three, two, one. He is um, right before you see the hitchhiking ghosts. As you turn to face that sort of mausoleum area, there's like an archway above you. The crow is sitting on top of that archway. Oh, I've never seen that one. Yeah. They take it out sometimes and they put it back? So, sometimes he'll be missing, but you'll still hear the sound. Sometimes he'll be there. Why the I'm hell do they do that? Just to pre- probably his wings aren't flapping right. Maybe they got to take him backstage. I'm not sure. It's a tiny little bird animatronic. How hard could it be to get that? That's what, I, that's what the first animatronics were at Disneyland. <laughs> we're the little birds. That's true. Have you ever listened to the sights and sounds of the Haunted Mansion? No, I have not. What is that? It's an old record they put. It was a record at the time. It's the original. What was supposed to be the original story of the Haunted Mansion when it opened in 69. Gotcha. And they have the Raven leading them through the house in in addition to the ghost host. It must have been late because they still made the animatronic and have it in the ride. Yeah, they wouldn't do that. If... At multiple points, too. Yeah, it's some crazy. points where the ghost host starts talking to you again. This is actually something I found and I don't believe it. Apparently, when the ride first opened, they had a scare actor be the caretaker. There might be some wires getting crossed here because, OK, Again, it's a little offhand Disney moment. They did have live scare actors in the Haunted Mansion for the 50th, obviously, a couple years ago, 2019, they did that. But back in the 90s, not for the caretaker, but instead in the endless hallway scene, there would be a knight. Yeah. A scare actor night. And then there would be a phantom. There was, I think, like a devil or a demon. One of my friends, actually, Ian, was the night scare actor. Oh, that's crazy. In the endless hallway. And I've seen photos of that night. Yeah. So I know that's true, but I've never once heard. I've of never heard the, the caretaker. caretaker. Uh, that not, would be a fun. That would be a fun job to have, though. Do they let you bring your dog to work? I'm not or does quite it have sure. To be malnourished to bring it in. Why? If you're playing the, the yeah, scare, we're, we're casting the dogs, but they have to be never fed. Yeah, <laughs> bring your dog in, but also don't feed him for a couple weeks. And don't feed yourself either. I'm I'm kind of curious. I, I if if you guys know if anybody has any kind of like home video footage of an actual caretaker scare actor, let us know. Send it in. All right. Well, that does it for fun facts. Let's discuss how popular this attraction is today. What are the average wait times? Where does it fit in the media landscape of the park? Does it fill any holes? And how do people feel about this ride today? I would say that the current reputation of this ride has stayed rather constant for the past few decades, which is pretty damn impressive considering that this opened in 1969. Right. It's got an all-time average wait time. This is for Disneyland Park in California. An all-time average wait time of 28 minutes. And according to thrilldata.com, the highest recorded wait time of 135 minutes. For the act, for just the original attraction or Haunted Mansion Holiday? Okay. So this is where it gets kind of slippery because this was on September 13th of 22, which would have been like, for example, this year that would have, that would definitely be Haunted Mansion Holiday. Yeah. I'm trying to think of when they started the Halloween season last year. I think it was the Either the first or the eighth. They did it the first this year. So that might be Haunted Mansion Holiday. This is Thrilldata.com's information, but someone did tweet in summer of 2019. (laughs) uh, (laughs) You're just laughing at like this is deep research. I'm impressed. Someone did post a screen grab of the Disneyland app featuring Haunted Mansion with an 180 minute wait. Wow. In the summer of 2019, which I thought was kind of random and weird until you realize that is the 50th anniversary, right? Was it 20, 2019? 2019. 19, so yeah, if 59. it was in summer of 2019, perhaps it had something to do with the 50th anniversary. Interesting. Of how it could climb to three hours. Minutes. 180. It must have been. It could have been during the day. You know, because they shut Mm. the park down for that after hours event. Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so during the day, all the people who couldn't get access to that probably went in and got in line. That wouldn't surprise me. As for (laughs) Magic Kingdom, all time average wait time is 37 minutes. That's pretty high. Which is relatively high, but you also have to keep in mind Magic Kingdom, not as many attractions as Disneyland. Yeah, so true. We could talk about that. I mean, we, the difference is there's more scenes, but I do appreciate Disneyland's more. That's I, right. I agree. Magic Kingdom has like a little bit of a different opening to Uh-oh. the ride. I remember there's some footsteps like, you know, like that library looking. Yeah, the endless staircase. With those, those yeah, paranormal looking footsteps mm-hmm. that you see hitting those. Very much inspired by the Winchester Mansion. And then Magic Kingdom features a highest recorded wait time of 180 minutes. This is on July 17th of 2019. So that was another summer 50th 2019. So 50th anniversary. That would make sense. Although that wouldn't be the 50th anniversary not for the of, haunted, the, mag- of yeah, the Magic, not the Magic Kingdom, Kingdom version. I wonder if they still celebrated that though. I'm sure um, I'm sure the people out there had to get as much Haunted Mansion in as they could that day. It's still a very popular ride. Like I, I, I still am very much, obviously I'm a weirdo, but I'm excited to go on Haunted Mansion every time I go to the park. And I do still feel like it's on everyone's must rides when they go to Disneyland. I feel like I has the biggest note pun intended cult following of any of the disney rides I would agree even with that. even more so than pirates and i could get the cult following sometimes things that have kind of a spooky slant generate more of a cult following like you see that with kind of like b-level horror films you 
don't see that with B-level drama films. Anyways, let's move on to uh, first impressions. Let's just let's just talk about what was your actual first impression of this ride? Like, what do you remember feeling? Well, the first time I went on the Haunted Mansion, I was two years old and I closed my eyes the entire time. Didn't want to see it. <laughs> I was too scared. The first time I really went on it was the visit after that. It's so, like I said, it's so unique for Disney to do horror and they do it in such a unique way. It's its own beast, you know? You yeah. don't get an attraction like that anywhere else in the park. Now, yeah. will you say some of your enjoyment with riding it today stems from those early memories of riding it where you're basically shitting your pants? Right. I never really thought about it like that. In terms of first impressions on my end... Uh, I find it wildly ironic that the first half of the attraction is more horror based and then the second half is more like silly and goofy because when I went on it at a few years old, the graveyard, the pop-ups there, yeah. that was the first jump scare I ever experienced in my life. <laughs> so that graveyard scene as like a three-year-old was horrifying because I hated those things popping up and doing their little, Bah! like even to this day, it's just the... <laughs> yeah, they pop up. it's a lot. And you know, maybe we might talk about that in the good and the bad. I remember when I went on this ride for the first time, I was a weird little kid and I was obsessed with scary things. You go figure. Uh, <laughs> I would read Goosebumps and things like that. Love and, Goosebumps. And then, you know, uh, camp out in my parents' bedroom. Not wake them up, but I would stand at the foot of my mother's bed and just watch her as she slept. <laughs> just like they wake up in the, like 3 a.m. and there's just a child standing there's there at the foot of There's this child with a little grudge boy haircut just looking at her. I would do stuff like that. And so naturally, I, I loved this ride. And it did scare me, but I was thrilled by that. And I, I think more than anything, I just recall being amazed at the storytelling because this was also around the time when I was getting into movies. I think I was like four when I first rode this ride. I just remember being transferred to another world unlike any other attraction had done to me. And I still think that it holds that warm place in my heart which kind of got me into movies and theme parks and storytelling in general. Haunted Mansion was definitely the gateway for me into the wider world of Disney lore. Let's move on to the good and the bad. This is where we talk about the things that are good and then the bad things, you know, about this ride. But before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So let's talk about some of the good. I have a bunch of things written down here and we could just kind of talk about them. I think this is maybe the best facade in the entire Disneyland Resort. And I think when you factor in design and overall atmosphere and how it actually ties into the land that it's in, I don't think there's anything that quite matches it. The only thing that comes close to me is probably Splash Mountain, but that's now gone. I think Haunted Mansion's facade does the rare thing where it actually tells a story as well as being impressive. I love that they had the integrity of keeping the switchbacks away from the front of the mm. facade. Yes, that's a and good tucking point. It yeah. back. And I don't normally like switchbacks, but I will say these are tastefully done. You get an idea of what the ride is before you get on the ride. You're able to kind of come up with all the things that it could be. You're, they found a way to kind of torture you without actually putting you on the ride. And I always love that. I also like the immediate establishment of mood and tone once you enter the foyer. You, you hear those first notes on the, on the organ. You see the candelabra chandelier. You're instantly transported in a way that most other rides don't do for you. The pre-show starts almost immediately. It's, it's, it's incredible. But yeah, I think... The pre-show for the mansion was one of the first experiences of like walking through almost ride scenes before you get on the actual ride. And I guess that's where you could kind of see like the it's it's history as a, a walkthrough attraction in conception. It's kind of amazing to me that a ride that came out in 69 still has one of the best pre-shows in the entire park. The lines are like really blurred between when the experience really starts. And that's, that's another that, debate. I do believe Haunted Mansion is the first attraction that does that. Speaking of the pre-show, I just love when people come up with a creative solution for a logistical problem. They needed to get guests under the railroad to the show building. They came up with the stretching room. Is this haunted room actually stretching? Or is it your imagination? How fucking insane is that? It goes down at Disneyland to get you underneath the railroad tracks underneath the berm of the park into the show building. At Disney World, the ceiling goes up. It's and crazy. it holds so much creative value that Magic Kingdom didn't have to do it no. for functionality. Yeah. It's so good for the experience that they do it anyways. Next thing I have here is Paul Freeze. I mean, I just wrote Paul Freeze. It, it, what can you say? It, the dude has a buttery ass voice. I could listen to him talk all day. I wish he was doing this podcast. Uh, I, maybe some of the best voiceover narration on a ride I've ever. To somehow sound insanely pompous and right. full of himself oh, while being true. so safety bar please i will lower it for i will lower it for yeah. oh that's pretty good no, they'll you. be waiting for me sure, <laughs> sure. Which, which, which also another creative solution to something that didn't need it like you know they're gonna lower this lap bar it does that on almost every Omnimover ride mm -hmm. but they made it into like part of the story it's part of the show yeah it's incredible yep 
uh, uh, moving on here, Portrait Hall. Love that. Used to scare the shit out of me as a kid. Love the lightning, though. The paintings themselves are just beautiful to look at. Which one was your favorite painting? My favorite changing portrait? I like the knight on the horse. The black knight is what it's called, is my favorite. Oh, I always mm. liked the lady who had the tentacles coming out of her head. Medusa? Yeah. Wait, is that actually just... <laughs> yeah, it's Medusa. She's got snakes coming out of her head, <laughs> Who's right? Who's that lady with the tentacles coming out of her head? I sounded like a hillbilly right there, but I didn't realize... I guess I just because it was in the Haunted Mansion, I never put it together that they could reference Greek mythology. <laughs> they do it a couple times, I think. The mood of the, the beginning of this ride, can we just talk about that? Once you go up those stairs, you are completely in it and in a different world. What What's your favorite part of like the beginning here? My favorite Part. I love the zombie. I, I don't know what what a better word for it would be. Oh, the, the zombie guy in, in the, the coffin. coffin. Yeah, he's saying things too, right? Yeah, he says, "Get me out of here. Let me out. Help me." <laughs> it's pretty inspired stuff, That's right my there. Favorite. And it's just like the glass behind him too. If you look closely at it, there's like been rocks had been thrown through the glass. There's little rock shaped holes. Oh my god, you're him. right. It's so well done. Everlasting hallway is probably my favorite part. Listen. Oh, what a great illusion. Uh, the candelabra kind of just floating in the hallway. I actually don't know how they accomplished that, but it's very effective. Mirrors. It's got to be. It's always the answer. Mirrors, dude. What about you? I'm going to go with the music. Obviously, Grim Gritting Ghosts uh, is very iconic, but their ability to integrate those notes into the beginning of the attraction. How the music so changes. So how, it, yeah. how it's very haunting. For yeah, the first half point. of the attraction, and then it opens up into this playful Happy Haunts materialized. But it's the same melody, like it's the same notes. Same melody, same tempo, everything. It just changes instrumentally. Yeah, it's the same the motif ride. that kind of just evolves as the ride goes on. Also, I love the door crunching. The door crunching is so cool. I don't know if you guys have seen the movie The Haunting that came out in 1963, which was about six years before this ride. But Parts there, of it are based off of The Haunting. The there, there, there is a scene in The Haunting where the door literally like the pressure of something pushing on it from the other side you know, extends outwards and, and crunches and that sound design is so effective. They do that in this ride and it is amazing. I love the corridor of doors is such a great place. Also great wallpaper. Demon clock. Who doesn't like a demon clock? I don't really know what it's it's selling, but you know, it's it's one of those original. That was a Rolly Crump. That makes design. sense. So was the Donald Duck chair, right? Yep, the Donald Duck chair that is now being removed from Walt Disney World. Hmm. Oh, for the Hatbox Ghost. If you want to get mad, we can talk about that too. <laughs> Anyways, uh, moving on to the seance scene, it's it's this is also spectacular. I used to love this room as a kid. The effect of having the floating instruments still very effective in the dark lighting. Ballroom, you know, everyone loves the ballroom. We, we, you, we, I'm sure you've all heard of the Pepper's Ghost effect used to great uh, measure here. People say it's a hologram. It's just glass and light, baby. So much fun gags in this room. We got our guy riding the chandelier. He's having a good time. We got the ghosts shooting each other. Is there one thing in particular that you like looking at in this oh, scene? In the bottom. I love the wraiths is what I call them. Flying in through the window. Oh yeah, those are out. good. They're like oh. sheet ghosts almost, yeah. but you can't really see their face. Mm. I love them. And they're, you see them later in the uh, graveyard scene riding bikes. Moving on to the attic here. Piano gag, very funny. Shadow playing the piano. I like it. <laughs> Very good. Also, I think this might be the worst place to sleep in the entire park. People always ask me, like, if you could live in one place mm. in, in Disneyland, where would you live? I think this is the worst place to live. In not, the attic scene? Not the Haunted Mansion, but just this attic in particular. That's fair. You know, it is, it's got a lot of, just the artifacts, the set dressing, I think. We talk about how good they are at building this world and building these sets in the Haunted Mansion. I think it's very much on display in the attic, which makes it the scariest place to sleep. Attic transition to the graveyard, top tier transition. And that's among a ride that already does transitions better than almost any ride in Disneyland. <laughs> There's argument of what's actually happening here. Yeah. I'm of the mind that you get scared by the bride, you fall out a window, you fall down a hill, you die, and now you're in the graveyard and you're a ghost. That's my take on it. I mean, I think story-wise, they didn't really plan out to die at all. You didn't, they didn't see like, oh, you're gonna fall out the attic window. I'm assuming it was just like a transition. I am a fan of the death theory though, that you, you finally see them because they're not Pepper's ghost anymore. They're no. not, you know, they're physical animatronics figures you can see you don't see through them anymore they're, they're dudes not translucent you can see. yeah exactly yeah. they're dudes you could see so i i like that i'll be i'd be remiss if we didn't mention the hat box ghost he's chilling there kind of just doing his thing fun effect glad they brought him back yeah 
it's cool. It's thrilling to see the effect. It's still very, very cool. And you know, the, the, the guy that pulled, I forget his name, the, the guy that ended up pulling off this effect was a massive Yale Gracie fan growing up. Yes, I know like, who you're that talking was, about. I think he, he considered him as his quote unquote, his Michael Jordan. He had like posters of him on his wall and That's stuff. That's right. You're right. Yeah. And being able um, to bring back the Hatbox Ghost, that must have been awesome. Really cool how that came full circle. And then we're in the graveyard. This is just a banger of a show scene. I mean, it's one of the most impressive showrooms I've seen in terms of just scale. It's like, huge. It's enormous. There's so much going on. There's a lot of funny gags. There's a ghost. There's a ghost lady. She's sitting on a swing and she has what appears to either be milk and cookies or a tea and a saucer plate. What's going on there? They're having a part. It's a swinging wake. <laughs> yeah, but if you're, I don't know if you've ever sat on a swing, Dallin, <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing you don't want to be doing when you're sitting on a swing, holding a mug full of liquid. Well, here's the question. Is it? ghost tea or is it like actual you know or or like milk like can they drink i just think get off the swing another thing i like there's also a fucking mummy uh the mummy is my favorite ghost <laughs> in all of the haunting Edge. he's my favorite character it's a lost gag it's a mark davis gag i just think it's really funny that there's a mummy in this ride it doesn't make any sense of the lore the because there's no like witch here where's dracula there is dracula dracula is in the mansion bullshit where there is uh walt disney world only oh. he's an exclusive wait where is he in walt disney the world? sinister 13 i believe is what they're called in the loading zone area of their mansion they have unused changing portraits that were planned as changing portraits for here in, uh, in anaheim but they didn't, never ended up doing it and these portraits do not change they have the Wolfman, the Drifter, oh they have Dracula. <laughs> I got to look at this. This yeah, is great. Those, those are all real. Is there any other gags that I did not highlight in that graveyard scene that you guys like? <laughs> we so talked like about the, the mummy. There's a lot dude. of gags. Yeah. I mean, like that are the arm like plastering oh, that yeah. wall. Oh, that's, yeah. That's a um, reference to the old cask of Amontillado. <gasps> oh, that's story right. By Interesting. I love that one. Instead too, of getting bricked in, he's bricking himself in. I love the crashed hearse, too. That's another thing that's, uh, that I really love because you can oh, see yeah, the tracks yeah, yeah, yeah. through the mud of this hearse and then the coffin is Oh my God, I never noticed there. that. I'm going to look for that next it time. It is I'm crashed. There. Yeah, if you look at it. I think those are my favorite gags in there. I, I The hitchhiking ghost used to freak me out. Because <laughs> I didn't like them sitting on my lap. <laughs> I, that was not something I enjoyed as a child, but I like it now. It's very fun. You could take a fun selfie. Also, to end my good section here, Tiny Bride. I love something something that's very tiny. Little Yoda? It doesn't make any sense. I don't know why she got tiny. You ready for some lore? Why Leota tiny? Okay. Little Leota is small, not because she's <laughs> far away. She's tiny because she's like Irish, Scottish mythology. I can't remember which one. One yeah. of those two. Wisps or pixies, fairies. Yes, yes. She's not wearing a wedding dress. She's wearing a cloak and she's not holding flowers. She's holding like herbs. And that's usually how they would appear, like on your mantle, wearing a cloak, little tiny fairies or wisps. So they, they were really beckon. going for it. They got the mummy and then now they have a little fairy. Yeah. Huh. That's the little Yoda backstory. And now she's just kind of like a small bride. Even in like some merchandise, they've made her a bride. It's not accurate. She's wearing a cloak. You know what I would love? And Disney, if you're listening to this, take, you could have this one on the house. I would love a Christmas decoration of little Yoda that speaks and says the little thing Ooh, she says. Yeah, you could put them up on the mantle. Hold your stockings and tell Santa to hurry back. I want her to be on the top of my tree, just saying bullshit. Very like, cool. Throughout the night. My wife would not like it, but I would love it. Have yeah. it scheduled so like every 30 minutes, just deliver a very loud hurry back. Was uh, the first time you see Madame Leota and the, the balls, is that the first time they ever used projection mapping? I think so. Oh, I wow. I think that That's might cool. be. Yeah. I didn't think about that. It's an internal projection, I think, now. Yeah. So rear projection. That's why they had, they had yeah. to keep her head like insanely still. Yeah. Uh, was it Leota Toombs? Yeah. Was the uh, Imagineer that they... And then Kira Irvine later. That's right. The, yep. the, the and daughter. Then, uh, Eleanor Oddly was the voice. You may know her as Maleficent. Give us a gift by ringing the bell. Oh, well, we just like ruled a three that and it was <laughs> not a comedy version. It was a nerd version. <laughs> <laughs> we just went off. Now, do you prefer the uh, Leota head floating through the air or stationary on the table? I think I, I prefer her stationary on the table. I can see why she floats through the air. It makes the scene a bit more dynamic, a bit more interesting. A lot of people think she's just a floating head now, though. <laughs> it doesn't translate that she's supposed to be inside of a crystal ball. God, I'd love to be her. If I die and you and I was just a floating head. I could see your cackling head floating around in my nightmares for I, sure. I can too. But yeah, if there's anything else that you find, you just, you, you have the urge to talk about that you just really look for every time you ride this ride. Is there anything else? I look, so this is on the outside, actually. The set dressing on the second story terrace of the mansion. Oh yeah. The telescope, you know, 
the 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 dining table set up like someone was just eating there and then they left. Oh my god, I've never even noticed that. Yeah. Anyways, moving on to the bad. I really <laughs> I it, see two marks. Yeah, there. It, it was really hard for me to come up with these. I really had to rack my brain because I don't want this to seem like totally like a Homer podcast. But I, it, look, uh, the Tombstone Jumpers. <laughs> Kind of cheap scare, you know, it's a jump scare. I'm not a big fan of jump scares in movies, and Byron already mentioned wetting his pants as a, as a child to, to one of these, and I, I get it, they're effective, but I just think it's a little beneath what they're doing in the mansion, like in terms of all the effects that feel so A-class. A little too county fair. Yeah, a little too county fair. And maybe that's the, that was like Walt's nod to that. Like, hey, sure. maybe this was kind of like a, I'll do your best gag as one of my worst gags. kind of Right. Thing. <laughs> Although he wasn't involved for the last few years. That's of true. This, so uh, that's, that's a good question. Would Walt have approved? Of... I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have. Maybe. Maybe that's a hot take. I think I think he would have been like, this is tacky. I think if you watch some of the behind the scenes of them developing the ride, you can see them making it. Like it's from the Imagineering Workshop and you can see them fabricating some of the pop-ups. But I feel like that would still be after his death, right? Right? Probably. Yeah. Because it was just the facade. Until uh, after that's the right. We're reaching here. But yeah, I'm, sure. Uh, and then the last one I have here, I really don't like that goofy ass bride that's in the attic now. When they changed it in 2006 to that like lady who has like the like the projection face and she's like, Ooh, I'm so glad just, we like, finally got to the And breath. she does these kind of like little like I do. expressions. I did. Stop. Uh-huh. Just stop. <laughs> yeah, shut. I every time I pass her, I'm like, shut up. Like, I don't like it. <laughs> I, it's she's a very early projection animatronic and you can certainly tell because oh boy, it does not you? look good. I like the character. I think they could do a lot with the character, Constance Hatchaway, but the figure itself and what she brings to the attic scene, I think totally kills any momentum leading up to it. It, it completely kills the tone of that attic. Yeah. Like before it was like this nice like figurine, like just almost like a mannequin of sorts. Yeah, she would barely a, move. And a red beating heart and there was like a, a slight breeze on her. Mm. It was very spooky. That's all you need. And the paintings leading up to that, that yeah. tells the like, story right every there. new like necklace yep can we please uh, get necklace. rid of this goofy lady did were you at d23 last year did either of you go to d23 no last year? unfortunately no. did not. they had a scene in the archives area of that original bride as close as we are now that's cool walk right up to her you should have taken it I and have... then brought it with you to disneyland and just stuck just it. a big briefcase <laughs> <laughs> anyways if you guys don't have any other bads i'll just go with oh, i'm curious is there another bad? yeah byron what do you got I, you know what and this is this is so nitpicky i love the placement of the switchbacks of the queue however i don't don't know if there's a lot really going on back there. Like you did mention, they are going to add to the queue now. I think. Less of an addition, more of just a complete redo. Like, are Leo- you upset about that, by the way? I, I actually really like it. Uh, some are some folks are upset. It's, like not, a, it's not gonna be interactive, like I said, the same way Orlando's is. There's not gonna be toys to touch. It's yeah, just gonna God. be more themed. That's yeah. cool. So I, it's like, like a Leota's garden, right? Yeah. How do you feel in general about them improving older attractions? If they do it right, they do it really right. And if they do it wrong, they usually do it really wrong. Like the Hatbox Ghost in Magic Kingdom. Not a good, not a good uh, change there. I say this all the time because I talk mm-hmm. with Imagineers all the time. They're with us. They're on our side. It's just the higher ups, the stuff they have to get through I sometimes see. never translates. Like everything you've thought of that you're like, oh, they should do this or I hate this. They have been over. Let's move on to the world-class test, which is the last portion of this episode, the moment you've all been waiting for. But before we do that, let's have a word from our sponsors. Moving on to the world-class tests. This is a rubric of 10 tests, painstakingly devised by Byron and myself, to determine if an attraction is world-class. To receive the highly coveted world-class pass, the attraction must pass 7 out of 10 tests, or 70% of our tests. That's a C. A score of 6 out of 10, or 60%, leaves the attraction up for debate. That means we could debate amongst ourselves if we think we could push it to the world-class pass. Anything lower than 60% is an automatic fail. Let's get into it. Test number one, the average tourist test. Would the average tourist have a hard time getting on this ride? Is there a long wait? Is there a complicated queue system? No, the average tourist doesn't know what kind of attraction it is. I get a lot that people think there's a loop. People think it's a roller coaster. People think it's a thrill ride. But in terms of just getting onto the attraction, basic you hop in line. Even like you don't need the lightning lane. You don't need the genie plus. You don't. It's usually pretty short. No, and it's not one of those weird things where you have to pay to play or you don't have to, you have to get into some sort of weird- sort of You weird, gotta get uh, the Haunted Mansion ghost grabbing gauntlets that yeah, you can exactly. use. Yeah, exactly, or you have, to, you have to get in line for some virtual queue. You just get in the standby, you get in line, it's usually about a 30 minute wait. Go through your switchbacks. It never goes below 13 minutes because they always uh, yep. they keep that for the- Oh, that's what really is, What's the lore behind that again? Because they did the same thing with Tower of well, Terror. Well, 13 is just a scoop, it's spooky, spooky number. It's unlucky, a spooky number. Unlucky, unlucky, yeah. spooky number. Pretty, pretty fun. Um, it's- <laughs> Couldn't think of anything profound there, yeah, but I this know, is uh, <laughs> like, 
<laughs> it is fun. Anyways, one for one. We're off to a good start. Good job. Test number two, the Leslie Stahl test. Will you be willing to wait 60 minutes for this ride? I get to go to Disneyland once a month, so I would. Would you wait 60 oh, minutes? Oh man, this is this is a really tough question. Let's go to Byron first, because I don't want to. It highly depends on who you are. If you've never been on this attraction and you are at Disneyland for one day, this is your one shot, you have to wait 60 minutes must, for this attraction. Yeah. However, like idiots like ourselves who go all the time, 60 minutes doesn't really seem like a sweet deal because as we mentioned earlier, usually the average wait time is 30 minutes or less. Let's say you're from out, you're, you have guests from out of town and they're like, we want to get a Haunted Mansion. Oh, absolutely. I would wait 60, 60 minutes. minutes. I would, I would, yeah. And you know, oh, it's, it's a real, man. it's it's an entertaining cue. It, it's constantly moving. It passes for me. Um, Ryan's going to be the odd man out here. I think I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I would. And it's only because I never have. Me and my current version where I go all the time, I would not. But I could see a version of me that would. I, I think if I'm being honest with myself, though, I would not wait 60 minutes. For that's this. right. Hey, that's totally fair. Ooh, and it's my, it's like my second favorite ride, too. That's what's weird about it. Ryan, you know, know what's great about having a guest? Yeah. Is that uh, we get to overwrite your? Hey man, your, that's fine. I want to be overridden. All in here. favor? I want to be overridden. Two out of three, it passes. That's Great. a pass. We're gonna move on. Oh man, I'm so embarrassed about that. I had to be honest though. Two I, for two. Two for two. Moving on to number three, the smartphone test. Does the queue of this ride have enough to keep you off of your smartphone? It has enough to keep me off my smartphone. I think I have enough to keep the fucking moms from Kansas off their smartphones. <laughs> Every time I'm on that, there's like three doom buggies down. You could see it in Leota's room. Someone's on their phone. On their phone. But the queue though particularly the queue to keep you off your not here i disagree you think so i disagree because i think even in the beginning the exterior queue section there's fun things there's tombstones you could look at that have fun True. writing on them there's things to distract and that you set dressing i was talking about and then you get inside and it's like come on forget and about then it. you can't get your there's no way you're on your phone inside the yeah. foyer on that's i think this is a clear pass for me it truly depends on whether or not you're standing in those outdoor switchbacks or not if you're in that switchback and it's hot outside and you're waiting 60 minutes it's brutal but if you're, if it's, you know, 35 minutes, you spend 15 minutes outside, 15 minutes inside, I would say it's a pass. It's, it's, it's very even for me, leaning more towards pass. Obviously I'm biased though. Most of the time you do not have to wait in those outdoor switchbacks. You don't, but even if you do, there's some, there's, there's stuff to look and at. And there is still just, and I'm still on the fence with just having enough atmosphere outside. There's room for improvement. I know I mentioned the bad. I do believe this gets a pass. And then That's, you got the new queue coming up And we got the new queue coming up. It's going to be an easy pass. Three for three. Three for three. It's a pass. So this is great. Test number four, the Tony Stark test. How innovative is this attraction? Does it push theme park tech forward? <laughs> at the time of opening or currently like modern day today? B both. I mean, I, I think if you look at it from the time You're of opening, right. this is the first Omni mover, right? I believe it's the second after Adventure Through Inner Space. And that yeah, was definitely the first one. If you're not one. counting forwards, yeah. As much as I like to think, oh, like there's so much new tech that went in for the opening of this, right? A lot of it is just taking tech that already existed, existed yeah. and creatively taking it to its fullest potential. I've read so many books on the Haunted Mansion and it's like their goal was to make it like a movie set. You're using movie effects from back in those days and just that's, doing them over and over again. Thing, even, even Pepper's Ghost, that's from the 1800s. Yeah, so it's old. I think this might be a fail. I, I hate to say it. I think this is a fail. I think I go fail just in terms of- You could say it elevated storytelling, alone, but then that might not even be true. Twisting my arm, the super innovative thing I could think of today would be the Hatbox Ghost animatronic with like the collapsing head and everything. But even then, yeah. That's okay. So. They don't all have to pass. No one's perfect. <sighs> that's a fail. Three for four. All right, moving on to test five. The Hollywood test. Can this attraction be adapted for the silver screen? Does it have a comprehensible story? Well, can it? It yes. has, twice. Can, can it be adapted? Absolutely. I'm gonna say that I do think this could be successfully adapted into a very good film. Yes. But obviously this is a pass, they've done it twice. Four out of five, test number six, the Simpson test. How likely is this to be replaced with some new IP? If you would have asked me 10 years ago, I'd have said 0%, but you ask me now, and I'm, oh, wow. I'm worried there's like a 2% chance that it might be replaced with something. I would bet my life that they would never do that. Are you willing to bet your life on that because you are so confident it won't get replaced? Or are you willing to bet your life on that because you don't want to be alive to see this? No, I don't think they would ever replace this. I think there would be an uproar. I think people would be very, very upset. And the fact that they're also making a new queue for it shows that they're trying to improve the ride. Yeah, there's no plans. They've consistently improved the ride over the years. They've done overlays. I just don't think there's any way they replace this. It's not going to go back to the future into The Simpsons. Heads would most certainly replace role so in that regard it's definitely a pass. I would say pass. I think it's a pass. Pass it. That is five out of six. Moving on to test number seven, the signature moment test. 
Can this ride hold its own without its signature moment? Is it a one trick pony? You can make an argument for any scene being the, the signature moment. I mean, the, the whole, the ballroom, the first that's time you got, see the Peppers that, ghost. The graveyard scene. Over the top of the graveyard, looking down on it with all the ghosts flying up. Yeah, It's I a showstopper. I, I really don't think there is a signature moment in this and that they're all great moments. So I think it's a pass in that it, this is definitely not a one trick pony. Easily pass for me. Yeah, this is an easy pass. I, I, I'm even embarrassed that we have to talk about it. That's six out of seven. So no matter what we could debate, but before we get into the last three tests here to determine if this ride is world-class, let's have another word from our sponsor. Okay, final three tests. Will this make it to seven? It's already at six, we'll see. I'm gonna vote no on the next one, no matter what, <laughs> just to make things interesting. All right, test number eight, the premature detraculation test. Wow. <laughs> Does this ride finish too fast? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I say no. I, I told you I'd say no in my next one. No, it does not finish too fast. I don't think so. I think this ride is the perfect length and I leave satisfied every single time. And I've said that for most of these, but there are rides that finish too fast and I'm not going to name them because they're going to be on the show eventually, but there's several that pop to mind. This is the perfect length. There are some rides that I would are, that one could argue are too long even. Ooh, I'm curious what ones come to your... I'm just thinking pirates. Oh, I was going to say, if you said living with the land, I'd tell you to leave. Living with the land needs to be four and a half hours long. <laughs> now, are you are you talking strictly Disneyland's pirate? That's just like Disneyland. 14 minutes and there's the nine minute version. That's a hot magic. take. No, no, no. I love every minute of it. I can mm. see why some people might think it's too long. Because, you know, you get past the jail scene where they're offering the dog a bone yeah, yeah. and there's another scene after that. And then you go up the waterfall and then you go around the bend and then you get back. There's to the some fat station. that could be trimmed, but I enjoy fat. It's my favorite part of a steak. Yeah. And for the sake of uh, <laughs> trimming the fat on this episode, we're going to all say that this is a pass. I think I'd this is a, a pass. pass. And that is it. That is seven. Automatically a world class ride. It has the world class pass. But for the sake of our records and seeing where it sits in the pantheon of other rides, we're going to keep going. Let's see how high this baby could go. All right. Moving on to test number nine, the exit hall test. Do you see people be physically excited getting off of this ride? Do they have that bounce in their step? Are they talking? Are they laughing? I think so. Especially here at Disneyland, we go up that little escalator, gives you time to marinate on the ride. Is there an energy that you take off this attraction into the rest oh, of your day? like an excited energy. You know when people get off like a roller coaster and they're like, dude, Woo! that was so sick. Yeah, 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 I see. Probably not then. I mean, I'm internally excited and stimulated, but I'm not gonna like, I'm not rushing to tell my, my friends like, how about that one? I'm, I'm going to admit that I'm not doing that. Bringing it back to the 50th anniversary with those life scare actors that they brought back. I did see everybody getting off the ride with so much energy. Like we have to go again. Well, screaming because you're getting about scared. It. Yeah. And it's new. I'm going to say no. No, it's a fail. Unanimous <laughs> too. It's not its style. Hey, I, I you think, know? yeah, it's not the vibe of the ride. Uh, seven out of nine. Moving into test number 10. The last test, the fine wine test. Has this ride aged well? Has your opinion of the attraction appreciated or depreciated since your first experience? Or if it's a new ride, do you think it will age well. You could say that this ride has aged probably the best over time of any Disney attraction. And I would agree with that. Yeah. I'm going to keep it at one pass, but I feel like this should be worth two because I do believe of the rides we've discussed so far, at least this is the best version of this. Easily. I think this ride is excellently upkept. I think that all the effects have aged well. They're not campy. They still play. And I think they're improving it year after year, decade after decade. I can't think of another classic attraction that has this much of a cult following that still has that kind of uh, focus within Disney, the company. The fact that they're still obsessed with it, they're still pumping out merch, they're still doing these after hours. Still events. making a movie, a they're shitty still, one, but still making. And we didn't even count the Muppet film, which I think is quite Muppet good. Haunted Man we haven't even talked about that's, Muppet's that's Haunted Mansion. That's a good movie. I think it's so a good, good. movie. That that's the be. best Haunted Mansion that's movie the, they've made. It is, out of the three that they've made, that's the best one. <laughs> Clearly that's a pass. Haunted Mansion officially gets the world-class pass with a score out of eight to 10. It's a fantastic ride. The Some, best agent. Sometimes I think it might be my favorite ride. Sometimes it's not, but it's in the conversation for my favorite ride of all time. It's your favorite. It's absolutely my favorite. Living with the Land is number two, but it's a very close two. There's no way you actually believe that. Living with the Land? Is number two. It is absolutely number two in my brain. <laughs> Unironically, everyone look at me. This Living with the Land. This is not a bit. Is so good. You're going to have to now fight for this attraction's honor one day. I will come back and I will go to bat for Living there's with no the Land. There's no way that's passing. It's <laughs> so no. good. We're going to do it, but there's no so way. So good. That does it for today's episode of For Your Amusement. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Dallas for coming on make sure you check out his youtube channel at offhand disney i'm offhand disney on everything instagram twitter and tiktok you mean twix like the X. candy yeah i call it twix and uh, you can follow me at, at ryan s Bergara on twix and you can follow me at, at, at ryan Bergara on instagram and threads and he's at byron a marin on all the aforementioned socials and follow the pod at fya pod on all of the socials 
And stay tuned for uh, our next episode, which is coming out on Tuesdays. This is a weekly podcast. So we'll see you on Tuesdays. Subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube. We'll see you all next week. Thank you guys for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>